I really like the fact that Rick has started this segment with a little visual diagnosis. Because I think most of us learn by stories. If you think back in medical school, you tend to remember a disease entity based on a patient that you saw. And I can still remember the first kid I ever saw with glomerular nephritis and what that kid was wearing and the story that went with it. Why? That's because the pediatrician who actually taught us that disease could tell a story. And so we're very much visually oriented. How come, it look, how come that's a, a, a lateral or an inferior infarct? Because it looks like an infarct. We tend to be that way. So that's why I like the fact that he's got these little visual clues here, and then you get to talk about the story. And I think that's, that's very useful. So as we go through, if you have any great visual clues, let me know, because I will tell you stories about all of this. First case, number six. By the way, this is visual diagnosis part two. And if we, if we look at that little picture, it ain't right, is it? And this is a 13-year-old. Now, you're going to sit there and say, well, there's not much that comes out of a 13-year-old. This has got to be his rectum. This is a prolapsed rectum. How hard can this be? The other thing is treating this is usually not very difficult. Most of them reduce. I'm trying to think if I ever had one that looked like this that didn't reduce. They reduce. Uh, if they're actually infarcted, that's a medical, a surgical emergency. That's a bad thing. But most of the time, they go back. It's like my hernia career. It's only a couple times that they've had to take them immediately to the operating room. Everything else we could always <clears throat> manipulate. And I'm a manual guy. I like manipulating things back into place. It's fun. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be an internist. I want to play with things. And, and so this, it went back in. But the real question about this, this case is, how come a 13-year-old has a prolapsed rectum? Number one, prolapsed rectum is, does run in families. There's no question about it. Anybody in your family ever had, yeah, my father said he had this, or something like that. It is almost always in somebody who has a family history. And so, whenever, and particularly when you're looking at kids, just ask. And, and no 13-year-old, most 13-year-olds aren't in there without their mother or father, usually their mother. Anybody had this? They'll give you a two-hour story, if you want, on everybody in the family who's had this. But the point is, why now? Why at this time? Why the rectum out? There's only one other question you've got to ask in this case, and that is, is there anything been going on? Remember that review of systems I said was a lie, that nobody did it? Now's the time you ought to say, did something kick this off? And in this case, it did. I've been coughing for three weeks. Now, I've been coughing for three weeks. I checked last night. My rectum is not prolapsed. Okay? <laughs> You know, there's only so much room there, and my head's already there, according to my wife. So uh, what am I going to do? Uh, but chronic coughing almost always is what sets off those people who have the genetic predisposition. If you strain hard enough, you can push the rectum out. And in this particular case, um, uh, by the way, other, uh, the questions he has here, are other members of the family at risk? The answer, was, as we just said, is yes. Families have it. Number two, chronic cough, three weeks kid. Were they properly immunized? Because when you think about it, pertussis presents this way. Um, I've, you know, I actually had my pertussis updated couple of years ago, you probably should too, because pertussis, uh, although we think of pertussis as being treated by macrolides and things like that, that's only if it's early on. After a short period of time, it doesn't affect it. In fact, there are people who say after five days of coughing, 
six days of coughing when you're into that phase of it, doesn't make any difference whether you treat them or not, uh, which is really unfortunate because we'd like to stop it. In general, we lie to patients about how long they're gonna be sick. But they usually shouldn't be sick three weeks. What are the keys that they've got pertussis? A lot of us cough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me take my water. But most of us don't cough to the point where we have to kind of roll over on our hands and knees and vomit at the end of the coughing. I'd ask them that question, how bad is this coughing? And you'll hear adults tell you, I've never had a cough like this. I actually cough to the point where, you know, it's going on for a minute, and then I vomit at the end of it. At the end of coughing, vomiting, ought to, ought to make you think about pertussis. The last thing is, I'm sure all of your emergency departments have converted over, and you are giving out Tdap. You might as well do it. After all, you're going to stick something in their arm so they get their, their little bit of pain. Somebody did a study to say, is there greater <coughs> complications if you give them just tetanus or you give them Tdap? The answer was, no difference. The reactions are about the same. It's almost never to the pertussis aspect of this. So if you're going to stick a needle in them, give them Tdap. And there's, the you know... Is there anybody not doing that these days? You know, everybody comes in for, and, and by the way, we tell the patient the wrong thing. We give them a card now that says, TDAP, here, stick this in your wallet, do whatever you want with it, because what did everybody else say in the past? Here, we hipped up your tetanus. No, we're doing more than that, and I think that it's, it's worthwhile. <clears throat> um, What's the best course of action to prevent pertussis? It is herd immunity. You know, again, I can't tell you how much damage Jenny McCarthy did to this country. She was on every damn talk show talking about the fact that immunizations made her kid autistic. Now, by the way, she says her kid isn't autistic. Be bad, okay? But the Harvard Medical School and all those people who've kind of looked at this, you know, have basically said this. It's the herd. It's the herd, Jack. That's why most, in, most uh, immunizations, pertussis is a good example, is about 80 to 90% effective. But if every person sitting around you it's 80 to 90% effective. It's real hard for the disease to get going in the community. Herd immunity. And so, you know, when, when people say to me, well, you know, how do you live long? How do you do this? <clears throat> I, I do a lot of not only med legal stuff, but political stuff about where you should spend your money. If I had a dollar, somebody gave me a buck and said, improve the health care of the United States, I'd give out immunizations. When you think about it, diphtheria, except in certain religious group pockets, we've wiped out. When's the last time you saw polio? I remember watching the day in 1968 at the University of Michigan Hospital where they took out the drinker respirators because we'd wiped out polio. I mean, come on. You want to spend a dollar on somebody who's got metastatic uh, uh, grade four astrocytoma? Or do you want to spend it on a kid with their, uh, so that they don't get all these myriad diseases? It is the best money we spend. We might as well do it. Okay, next case, case seven. One question. Yes. Do antibiotics uh, decrease infectivity even if it's in the way? Uh, they, they claim <clears throat> that it's worthwhile if somebody has pertussis to treat the family with the antibiotic at that moment in time. Probably five days after you start an antibiotic, even if you're carrying the, the bacterium, it drops it off. Okay, so you're no longer infective. 
that doesn't mean you're going to get better. You understand the difference. You've probably killed off your infectivity rate. So it's not a bad thing to do for everybody else around them. But when they come in and say, well, I've been coughing for seven days or 10 days, and, and uh, if you think you're gonna make the course of their disease shorter, the answer is no. If you think you're gonna prevent other people from getting, the answer may be yes. Uh, but they're still infective even if they're taking the macrolide for about five days. So it's not like you give a pill and 24 hours later you're, you're safe. It's about five days. So use that as sort of your general number. All right, next case. 36-year-old presents with a bad cold. Today he noted his, his uh, left eyelid became swollen. There is no pain uh, of consequence and vital signs are normal. You're looking at the CT scan and I think it doesn't take much to notice this one. On one side you're noting uh, on the <clears throat> looking down on it. The left one looks normal. The right set of sinuses obviously have crap in it. Look at the thickness of the sinus walls. That's why we use the term lamina papyracea. You know, if people always say, well, you got all these Latin names. They're perfect names. Lamina, wall of paper. How can you get better than that? Now, you will see these people. <clears throat> what have they usually been doing? It's not from trauma, generally. This is, this is people who have been blowing their nose at a high level, and, and the first one of these I saw, the guy came in and he was really a fun guy. He said, Doc, watch this. He pushed against his nose and went like this, and his eyeball bug, bugged out. I said, that's great. I said, this is a parlor trick of excellence. I said, in general, I wouldn't do that because <clears throat> you're just blowing snot into your eye uh, or around your eye. I said, it's probably not a good idea. But the lamina papyracea really is that thin. If you've never seen it. The other thing is, we tend to look at things in dead people, right? They gave you a skull in medical school. In live people, this stuff is not only thin, but it's got a little bit of movement to it. That's why most of us don't blow uh, our sinuses out. But if the thing is a little stiff, you can put stuff in there and it's not good. Uh, is there any way to know for sure <clears throat> whether these people are gonna require surgical intervention? Yes, it's this. <clears throat> Watch now. Here's another expensive medical thing, costs a million bucks, follow my finger. Look up. Entrapment. The only thing that's operated upon anymore is entrapment. In 1969, 1970, ENT people wanted to go in and put mesh in the floor or put it in the wall, and then somebody asked the key question, does it make any difference? The answer is, if it's not entrapped, it doesn't, and it's gonna get better. Do you antibiose them? Still a fight, still a debate. <clears throat> you know, I'm sure if Dr. Hoffman wandered back in, he'd say, don't you dare do that, smack ya. Uh, there are ENT people who would say, yes, we cover them for the major organisms because they are now wandering in next to critical eye structures. Nobody's got a proof of this. Understand you've got to warn them. Should it become warm, should it become red, now we've got a different problem on our hands. But I think um, these are the kind of things where you can be a hero. You walk in, say this is what it is. Now they did a, they obviously did a CT. But if you walked in and saw this guy, what are you gonna learn? I don't know exactly. The other thing is, nothing has to be done tonight. This is something you call the ENT guy on the phone and said, follow this guy. Because they're not taking anybody to the operating room tonight. Uh, if it happened today, you're not sure if there's a little entrapment. There's no vascular compromise here. That doesn't happen. 
It's just whether they're going to have to patch that wall up or not. It is not an immediate question. All right, next. <clears throat> Case eight. Patient is a 14-year-old, and that's important in this discussion. You're looking in the back of the throat of a 14-year-old. If it was a 7-year-old, the discussion would be even shorter, by the way. When is strep most common? Between about age 3 and 4 and age maybe 8. Those are strep people. They're covered with strep. There was a very interesting, we have a paper in the data bank. This is a Detroit paper where they went around in a classroom, uh, um, second grade or something like that in Detroit, and they just swabbed everybody's throat. They taught somebody how to do it correctly because most people don't do throat <coughs> swabs correctly, right? What do most people get? Spit. Because they don't actually wait to get the actual crap. But they went around in Detroit, they swabbed everybody's throat. In kids who had no complaints, no temperature, they did all that to make sure, are you sick? Nope. Take their temperature. Nope. 15% of kids were strep carriers. They were able to get it out of 15% of kids. Now, what if you think you, you, you can kill all the strep and it's not a problem? There, we also have a Tonsor, uh, tonsillar blended study where they threw tonsils after a tonsillectomy. They asked all these doctors, you're taking the tonsils out, they're not sick right now, right? <laughs> no, sir. But they've had chronic tonsillitis. Then they took the tonsils that they took out and put them in a blender. And they did not make a pate out of them, but they did put them in a blender and cultured them out. 25% of them grew strep. See, we'd like to think that we can control all this. The answer is, no, you can't. And there's lots of kids with strep throat, all that kind of stuff, particularly in that age range. Now, this is a 14-year-old with fever, sore throat. Here's the key. He denies cough. No cough. Mild sore throat, no pus and cough, is not strep throat. Strep has been very kind to us. Lansfield Group A, beta hemolytic strep, is still susceptible at the 99% level to what? Penicillin G. It doesn't get any cheaper than that. Literally. You can, you can get a handful of that stuff for two bucks that'll take care of this. You don't need something expensive. But there's a reason why we're talking about a 14-year-old here in this discussion. Because now we're moving into that age range. Is it going to be something else like mono? Is the mono test good? It's mediocre. Now... Understand that monopositivity advances as the longer you have mono. So if you think you're going to take a kid who's come in there, now I'm 18, I've got some pus, <clears throat> maybe a little cough too, so it's a little more confusing. So you do a mono spot. It's negative. Does that mean they don't have mono? No. Because if you actually look over the next seven days, that monospot test is going to become more positive. By the way, there is something called the Centaur criteria, and I'm absolutely in favor of them. If you're in the right age range, and you've got a fever, and no cough, and nodes, that's strep throat. Look in there, looks like strep, right age range, everything else. Is that good enough to do? Well. Here's the debate. Everybody who makes the rapid strep test, there's two or three makers, make a mistake as far as I'm concerned. They say, well, if a rapid strep is negative, what should you do? <coughs> Culture them. Oh my God. You've now changed that two-bit, $2 visit 
into another $125 event to do a culture. This is the way I've practiced for years. If it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's a duck. I give them, and I don't give them amoxicillin or ampicillin. I give them penicillin G. And the reason is, if you look at the data on mono, if you give ampicillin or amoxicillin to mono patients, almost 90% will get what? A rash. And now they think they're what? Allergic to penicillins. None of that's true. So this sounds old fashioned, and I am old. I rarely do, and strep testing can be 25% wrong, rapid strep. You realize the Centaur criteria is more right than the test. So to me, I use Centaur criteria. Looks like a duck, squawks like a duck. You got nodes, kid. You got a fever. You're not coughing. Here, here's two bucks worth of stuff. If you're not better in, in, uh, in five days, you take all 10. But here, if you're not better in five days, we'll see you back. And I think that's a perfectly rational way to do this. Understand, if you go in and, and say rapid strep negative, it's easy if rapid strep is positive, then you just give them the med. But remember what I told you, if you do a rapid strep test on kids randomly in a department, 15% of them are going to be... Uh, 15% will be positive. That's just the way it is. So I think I like the cheapest way of doing things. And I, I, I'm a believer in Occam's razor. Go with the most common thing, treat it, see what happens. What's the downside? People talk about, well, glomerulonephritis. Giving antibiotics does not change the rate of glomerulonephritis. You all know that. Treating strep throat with an antibiotic does not change the few people who will get glomeruli. What about rheumatic fever? Rheumatic fever has almost fallen off the map. You know, when I was a kid, there was more rheumatic fever around. I don't know whether the organism has changed or what's going on, <clears throat> but hear this. We've got a time interval here to treat people. It's not about the sore throat. It's about an antibody question against the heart. You have time here. Let's say the kid got his uh, two bucks worth of penicillin. Mother comes back in in five days and says he's not better. Okay, so now he's got strep. Have you changed the incidence of rheumatic fever if you treat it at that time? No, you haven't. You've got at least 14 days. The other thing is, no one can answer this question for me. Why did rheumatic fever, and all of us had to know the drones majors and the minors and all this other kind of stuff, right, of rheumatic fever. You had to learn all that when I was in med school. I don't know whether they even teach that stuff anymore. Why? Because it's so rare. Has anybody diagnosed rheumatic fever more than twice in the last year or two? I mean, maybe I'm seeing a different group of people than everybody else is, but I remember when, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon that three or four kids in a uh, elementary school had rheumatic fever. It's all gone, all gone. Case number nine. <clears throat> Sorry about this, I'm taking too much time. Case number nine, 60 year old man vacationing in Florida. Well, that's his problem, right? Okay. <laughs> Why you'd vacation in Florida, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> he was last known to be t uh, talking on a phone. He was found on the cement floor. Vital signs, normal. He had a previous history of a TIA. Well, that always throws some, a monkey wrench into it, right? <coughs> now he's on the floor and he had a previous TIA. Fortunately, uh, he's on meds for diabetes who isn't. Uh, he's got hypertension, he's got high cholesterol, he's got atrial fibrillation. This may have cured his atrial fibrillation. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. We may have something here. Um, in any event, you've got the photos down there, which are, are really nice. 
These are Lichtenberg lesions. Um, that is the one nice thing about when electricity enters the body. I love electricity. I, you know, I grew up wiring houses as a kid with my father. It's like the nervous system. It works or it doesn't. It goes from point A to point B. You know, when I was a kid working, you know, wiring houses, my dad used to go like this to check the wiring. You gotta be nuts. And, and uh, no, he said that little poke's not a problem. Um, he did, however, have a couple little problems there I won't tell you about. But uh, in any event, you'll notice the patterns here where what's it following? It's following the nerves. Fat is an insulator. Nerves are not an insulator. So what you've actually outlined here is the distribution of peripheral nerve patterns that are going out. The electricity follows two things in, well, in order. It follows uh, nerves and it follows uh, saline filled vessels. So it follows the, uh, uh, anything in a vascular system. Uh, it will also go on. But I love these pictures, they're great. Uh, when you see that, that's what you've got. By the way, is there anything we can do to actually help these people once they've had the electrical shock? Not much. I mean, they've had it. Here's, the, here's what you will see, however. Depending on how much they got, there are delayed neurologic problems. They do need to be followed. But it's not, for bur not usually for burns and things like that. Now, if they've actually been touching something, <coughs> one spot, where everything is channeled to, you can have a significant burn. What's the significance of him being on the cell phone? Is that an attractor? We don't know. Fortunately, um, most of you are not grounded all the time. If you are actually where everything went, you'd be in much bigger trouble. There was a thing on the news two days ago here, a guy in, he was in Florida. He was, he was, had his arm out the window of the car. But he's in a car, which is on tires. So the lightning was going to the ground. It just happened to go through his arm on the way down too. Guy walked away, no problems. He's got a, got a burn mark on one side of the elbow, one on the other. And if you look at the ground where this thing did, busted up the pavement, did all that kind of stuff, and he walked away. Depends on how you're grounded. You had a question? Yeah, who gets admitted if they have an arrest at the scene and they're resuscitated? Yeah, yeah. If they, if they have other... If they have, if they've had an alteration of consciousness, uh, they have more damage than you know about, you've got to admit them. Okay, they're going to have, they could have certainly further neurologic problems. Now, exactly what you're going to do about that, I don't know. Yes, exa exactly right. You're a damn genius. What you do is, is whenever you see a disaster coming, never carry a coffin by yourself. Get somebody else. And, of course, if they're a neurologist, they must know everything about lightning strikes, right? Shit, they know nothing about it, but the point is, they're a neurologist. I'm happy to have them admit the case and follow them. I just don't know what you do about it to make it any better. Listen, I think my time is up.